Please be seated. Mr. Kaiser, Ms. Ellenwood. Your Honor, the state's completed its case. We rest. Thank you. Subject again, ladies and gentlemen, to the attorneys and I reviewing all of the exhibits. The state at this time rests their case. Mr. Gray. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> we'll call as our first witness, Corey Burton. Thank you, sir. If you'll come forward. Face the clerk, raise your right hand for administration of the oath. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give in this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I'll be back? Come over and have a seat in the witness chair, and that microphone arm will swing in and out for your convenience. If you can. S Thank you. Mr. Gray. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Burton, where do you reside? 974 80th Avenue, Roberts, Wisconsin. And where did you grow up? I grew up in Hudson, Wisconsin. And how old of a man are you? I'm 44 years old. And are you married? I am. And children? Two children. Ages? 21 and 19. And where, do you, where are you employed? Bremer Bank in Lake Elmo, Minnesota. And do you have any other employment? Uh, I am co-owner of the newly founded Confidence Gun Safety uh, and Self-Defense uh, as of January 2020. Is that going off the ground yet as a business? Just got the LLC set up. And if you could let me rule on objections before there's answers overruled, he's given the answer, Mr. Gray. <clears throat> I do. And how long have you known him? Uh, in a professional sense, I met Mr. Fleischauer uh, at a large Fortune 500 company, uh, 3M Corporation in St. Paul, Minnesota, in 2004, I believe. And where are you employed now at Bremer Bank? Correct. And what's your employment there? What do you do? I am a technologist. I work uh, IT for several Wisconsin branches. Back in 2004, where did you work? Uh, 3M Corporation. <clears throat> That's where you met Kale Fleischauer? Correct. What did he do there? Uh, we both served in a server administration capacity, working with uh, Wintel servers uh, in the technology department. And did you become friends with them while working there? Yeah, through the professional relationship, we uh, established a, a personal relationship. We became friends. Uh, we knew each other until about a uh, uh, working relationship until about 2009 when I moved from 3M to Bremer Bank and it was shortly after Kale took employment at uh, U.S. Bank. And I believe I asked if you have children. Um, did you ever meet Kale's children? I did. And uh, remember the first time you met them? I do not remember the first time. So, <clears throat> at a point in time when you left 3M, uh, did you remain close friends with Kale, or did, was there a time period that you weren't? There was a time where we would uh, be more of a... Down. Please slow down and talk to this court reporter has to take this down. Sorry. And I have to think it. There was a time after um, our employment at 3M where we did... Uh, having a uh, casual acquaintance, maybe every couple times a year, uh, have lunch, uh, talk. Uh, it was not until he moved into his home uh, in New Richmond, where we uh, then met to help him move in. Uh, when you would meet with him and talk a few times during the year, <clears throat> do you recall what his conversation would be about? We would talk Section, about statement of the defendant offered on his own behalf. Sustain as to form. Did you learn about Kale's children when you had lunch with them? Objection, Judge. It's still a statement of a party opponent offered on his own behalf. Thank you. Not what he told you, but based on your observations. Uh, I have a son that the same age as Chase. We spoke regularly about the children. Okay. 
showing you what has been marked earlier in Exhibit 322. Can you identify that? That is Kale and Chase. I believe that was during his football years at uh, in high school at Tartan. Yeah, uh, football years. What do you mean? Junior, senior year, possibly. Very accurate picture of those two at that time period? That is. Offer exhibit 322. No objection. Received. The Stillwater football team. Titans. Section asked and answered. Sustained. So <clears throat> you mentioned after uh, Libby testified that after. Kelf Fleischauer moved to Richmond. Did you saw him more often or tell us about that? I did. Uh, when I heard that he was moving on this side of the river, I offered to help him uh, move his stuff into that, that home. And did you move, help him move the stuff in? I did. And who else was there when you were moving the stuff into his into his house. There were friends, uh, family in the form of uh, Summer and Chase. And was, was Chase and Summer Fleischauer helping you move in, helping kill Fleischauer? Yes. Move? And you remember what about that was? Spring of 2017, approximately. I did. And as a result of that, I'll back up. I'm going to show you what has been marked. Exhibit 323. Can you identify that? That is my statement of qualifications or my, my CV. Okay. Is it true and accurate? It is. No objection. Received. And Anna, why don't we try dimming the light, see if that helps. Either that or I think there's an adjustment so that you can blow it up, I think. Thank you. Turn the lights, Anna. Mr. Burton, uh, in 2013, did you take an eight-hour instructor course given by the National Rifle Association regarding pistol, regarding pistol? Yes, I did. Okay. I, I said that. Uh, National Rifle Association certified pistol instructor. Did you take that eight-hour course? I did. Did you get a certificate or a degree of some sort from that course that you passed it? I did. And you took the written test? Correct. Was there also live fire with that? Correct. And then next, did you, in 2015, take the National Rifle Association Certified Range Safety Officer 
pass that online to our course? That's correct. And just recently, in January of last year, or this year, you took a four-day defensive handgun course in Nevada, is that right? That's correct. Prior to that, were you in the Air Force? Yes. And what years were you in the Air Force? Uh, 1998 to 2002. And in the Air Force, did you qualify yearly with an M16 rifle? That's correct. Slow down again. Now, you also you testified that you're the owner of Confidence Gun Safety started. But prior to that, were you uh, employed at Bill's Gun Range in Hudson, Wisconsin? Yes. And did you teach uh, did you approximately 150 hours of classroom instruction from 12-2018 to 2019 Yes. And in addition to that, do you have a Utah concealed firearm instructor from one January 2014 to January 2017? Yes. And what is the significance of that concealed firearm instructor in Utah? As a concealed carry uh, instructor, you have reciprocity between states. Certain states will take your license uh, from another state. Uh, Utah was a popular license, uh, 2014 to 2017. Uh, my wife and I traveled to Utah to uh, be qualified to instruct uh, for the Utah concealed carry license. And <clears throat> have you been around firearms for some years? As long as I can remember. Okay. <clears throat> now getting to this uh, case, uh, you learned about it, correct? Correct. And as a result of what you learned about it, did it raise your interest with respect to the recoil or kickback of a Taurus 709 pistol? Yes. And what did you do with respect to first the pistol? Did you get one? I did. Okay. How did you get the pistol? Uh, I, I had to acquire a pistol that was similar to the pistol uh, that was in question in this case. Uh, I had found out uh, through Mr. Fleischauer that uh, Kale's uncle had purchased uh, Taurus PT-709 at the same time his father purchased a PT-709. Uh, so the guns were the same, uh, and that was a non-production gun, so it was a little tough to, to find another avenue to acquire that gun. I acquired it from uh, Kale's uncle, and that's where I got the gun. Of the gun, did you determine what kind of gun they had there? Tell the jury what kind of gun it was. Uh, it's the Taurus PT-709. Uh, it is a semi-automatic striker-fired uh, pistol that holds uh, seven rounds in the chamber, one, uh, seven rounds in the magazine, excuse me, and one round in the chamber. And <clears throat> you Did you, uh, after you determined that, did you do any more investigation of the gun? I did a function check of the weapon to make. What does that mean? Uh, a functional check of the weapon, since this weapon was not mine, uh, includes a check of the safeties, uh, a check of uh, the chamber, uh, and all other related parts that would uh, make that a safe firearm to shoot. And, uh, how many safeties of this gun? There are two safeties that the user engages with. Uh, that is the trigger safety on the front of the trigger. There is also a manual safety on the slide uh, that can be put into a position to disable this gun from firing. There is also a locking device on the right-hand side of the pistol that a user with the correct key can lock. So if you wanted to consider that a safety, that could be considered a safety as well. And um, did you test the trigger pull on this gun? I did. And tell us about that. This, 
This Taurus is a unique pistol in the sense that it is a polymer framed, uh, framed striker fired pistol. Hold on. Could you explain what you're just talking about? What it means? The pistol is uh, similar in form and function to many other pistols that are polymer framed, i.e., the grip. Uh, and a striker fired relates to how the firing pin uh, is struck and activates the firing sequence in that gun. Think Glock, Smith & Wesson, these, these types of pistols. What do you mean by that, Glock, Smith & Wesson? They're, they're, they're a similar design. But the Taurus PT-709 is an, uh, unique in design in that it has a two-stage trigger. Uh, the Taurus 709, when the slide is moved to the rear, uh, to engage the firing pin. The first pull of the trigger uh, is uh, a less, less uh, weight. Uh, the poundage that is the, the effort required to pull that trigger is less. Uh, and this differs in other polymer-framed semi-automatic pistols in that uh, it, is a, it is able to then fire uh, or release the, the firing pin uh, and fire in double action mode. What do you mean by fire in double action mode? In a standard polymer framed striker fired pistol, if you have a misfire, you have to activate the slide. You have to pull the slide to the rear, eject the, the cartridge that has been misfired, chamber a new cartridge, reset the firing pin and the striker uh, to engage this pistol uh, and have it come back into battery, which means ready to fire. You can simply pull the trigger without activating the slide, and it acts in a double action fashion. Double action and single action is, is something that I often have to clear up when I'm talking to those that don't have the familiarity with this pistol. And I can go into that if, yeah. if you like. When I say double action on the trigger of a pistol, think of the action that is being performed by that trigger. Um, the easiest way to describe this is if you had a revolver, everyone can picture a revolver with a hammer. Uh, if you pull the trigger in a double action revolver, you can see the hammer come back, and then you can also see the hammer come forward when you depress the trigger all the way to the rear. The trigger is performing two actions. In a single action firearm, the trigger simply releases the firing pin and it initiates the firing sequence. The unique nature of the Taurus PT-709 is that it has both. When the slide is moved to the rear, part of that action is already accomplished, moving the firing pin to the rear, which then allows it to have a lighter trigger pull by design than if you were to use it in double action mode. In what? In double action mode. And what was it? Did you test your, your uh, automatic as the trigger pull? I did. I obtained a Wheeler Digital uh, trigger gauge. This is simply a, an electronic device uh, that has a scale built into it. So you engage the scale with the trigger, uh, and it will give you a, a, a weight uh, in pounds, uh, how much trigger pull that gun has. And what was the trigger pull on it? If you can refer to your notes if you have them. Thank you. The single action pull was five pounds, 12 ounces, as measured on that Wheeler digital scale. The double action pull was six pounds, six ounces. And um, with respect to the five pounds, the first action trigger pull, is that a light trigger pull, heavy trigger pull, or in the middle? It's average. Pardon? It's average. Average trigger pull. So <clears throat> after you obtain the firearm and you tested it or looked it over, what did you do next? I needed a proof of concept. I'll back up a minute. Did you make out some notes as to what you did, a timeline of events? I did. Are these your 
your notes that you made up? They are. And you offer Exhibit 324, Your Honor? No objection. Received. You can refer to that when you're testifying. Refresh your memory if you need it. Okay. So after you acquired the gun and checked it out, what did you do next? Uh, initial recoil plausibility, plausibility testing. What does that mean? There seemed to be a lot of confusion around when a firearm is loosely restrained, how far that pistol can travel under its own recoil impulse. And in connection with that, what did you do? We did the uh, initial testing. I believe that uh, this was done uh, at my property at 974 80th Avenue uh, and just simply set that up in a cup and pulled the trigger. And when did you do that? That was on or about September 6th of 2019. And after you did that, um, what did you do next with respect to the firearm? After that, uh, we started to build a fixture to better hold this firearm. Uh, Lance Fleischauer was initially involved in this, uh, and then uh, I took over. And who's Lance Fleischauer? Lance Fleischauer is Kale's uncle. Okay. And the first time you tested that recoil, it was in a cup? Uh, say that again? The first time, backing up, the first time you test the re tested the recoil, you had the pistol in a cup? Correct. So now you decided not to have a cup, and what did you do? You started building a... We built a static form, uh, static human form uh, firearm testing apparatus. Uh, this is just a, uh, uh, a testing apparatus that would loosely hold uh, this pistol uh, to provide a safe means for us to activate the pistol and fire the pistol with a uh, certain amount of pressure on, on the grip. And would it be fair to say that uh, building this, what did you call it again? Static human form firearm testing apparatus. Static uniform testing apparatus was because you couldn't hold the gun yourself, correct? Correct. So you built it, did you? Correct. And how long did that take you to build? I had about 35 hours in from the initial time uh, of material acquisition to finishing the, the final form. And, after, and, then, and when did you finish? Building that Iron Man, you also call it an Iron Man? To make things a little bit easier, we've referred to it as an Iron Man. Okay. And when did you finish building that? October 15th of 2019. What did you do after that? It was time to gather the ammunition that would be used in this testing and to uh, begin testing uh, this the, the the firing of that Taurus. And uh, what kind of bullets did you use? Uh, I, I had that in my notes, if you'll let me check. These are Hornady uh, Critical Defense, 115 grain, 9 millimeter bullets with a energy similar to the bullets that were used in this case. And were those hollow points? They were. What's a hollow point? Hollow point is a self-defense round uh, that is generally used in handguns used for self-defense. So now you have, you got the ammo, what did you do next? You're done building the Iron Man and you have the ammo, what did you do? We test fired it. And uh, when were, when did you first test fire? The first test fire was uh, November 17th of 2019. The scope and the objective of this really was simply to determine two things. Uh, the the 1.3 pound handgun, when firing a self-defense cartridge generating 300 plus foot-pounds of energy, could that gun travel a certain distance if loosely restrained? 
The next objective in this, or this experiment was if that gun could be found in the condition that the gun was found the night uh, of Chase's death. And when you did that uh, experiment, uh, were you able to replicate the gun traveling a certain distance and ejecting a shell and putting another in the chamber? Initially, we could not. Uh, the function of the semi-automatic pistol requires a certain amount of resistance for that slide uh, to come back and react against and properly chamber another round. What During do you the mean by resistance? If you were to hold that firearm in your hand, if you had a loose grip on that firearm, it may not come back and hit that wall, that, that the resistance in your hand, to properly chamber that next round. So the handgun has to be held tightly enough to load and chamber the next round. Okay. The first time around, you didn't have that? In the experimentation that we did initially, we did not have enough pressure on the handgun to have that occur. So what did you do next? We uh, did a second test fire of that mannequin, the Iron Man, the static human form firearm testing apparatus and we changed the position uh, of that mannequin. And this went from an 89 degree position to a 54 degree position, which allowed more resistance for that handgun and then allowed that handgun to chamber, to cycle and chamber correctly. So what day did you do that? That was 11-23-19. And after you tested it on November 23rd, 23rd, 2019. What did you do next? We... Let's back up to the first please. testing. Was that inside or outside? That was outside. Okay, the second testing, was that inside or outside? That was inside. Okay. And... <clears throat> We missed one uh, piece in here about uh, the trigger. Uh, there was some trial and error to get this trigger to activate uh, in, a, in a manner that did not introduce any other uh, movement into the gun. Okay. But, uh, what did you do? That, that trigger was uh, designed with a piece of acrylic. It was a cam design configuration that sat inside the trigger guard uh, and was allowed the trigger, it allowed the trigger to be uh, activated with uh, a pull of the string. So what, what you mean, if I got this right, is that you put a piece of something, acrylic, that's what you call it? Acrylic. Acrylic? Plexiglass. And you put it between the trigger and what? Inside the trigger guard of the, okay. of the pistol. And then you had a string tied to that, is that right? Correct. And you pulled it? Correct. And would it come loose from the pistol? It would disengage and come out. Did you videotape that? This is going to make a lot more sense with a video. And do you have that videotape? I do. That is the thumb drive that the videos are on. Both of them? Correct. Okay. The, first video, the... the first video shows the detail of the remote trigger. Objection. Received. Well, actually, Judge, just so the record's clear, subject to my earlier objection. So noted, Mr. Thank Kaiser. You. Yes.
explain those? I can. That was uh, a close-up detail of what's happening when the trigger is depressed in single action mode on this firearm. Uh, that trigger moves to the rear, as I described earlier, uh, in a manner that is further than if the firearm was to be fired in double action. You can see in the first part of that video, uh, the trigger is pressed pretty far back, almost to the, to the back of that trigger guard. When that cam is pulled by the string, this, de this video demonstrates any extraneous force applied to the pistol. You can see the pistol fall to the right, not come jumping back or any other direction. And it, you just, the pistol didn't go off, right? The pistol was not loaded at this time. Okay. Yes. All right. So, and that demonstrates the fact that the what? That there are no other forces acting on that pistol other than what you saw in that video. Okay. And the picture up here now would be the mechanism you used to pull the trigger, is that right? That is the piece of acrylic that I referred to earlier. And that's the Taurus 709? That is correct. What's the other? Uh, that was just for demonstration purposes to hold the pistol up. I think that's a, a USB charger. Is that the end of the video? That is the end of the video. After you did that, um, showed the testing, mechanism of the firearm. What did you do next? It was then time to test fire the Taurus in a controlled environment at my home. The first uh, test we discussed was 11-17 uh, of 19. The second uh, test fire inside was 11-23. Uh, and then the videos were compiled from those test shots. There were Five test shots taken in both positions of the static human form uh, firearm testing apparatus. And then that final video is what I brought for a presentation here. Okay, and what is on that video? That video is going to show uh, this test fire apparatus. It's going to show me setting uh, the remote trigger, and it's going to show 10 test fires, five of which will be in a more straight up position, an 89 degree position. That did not obtain, we did not obtain the desired results with the gun in the state of readiness that the gun was found by um, officers and investigators at the scene. We then moved that mannequin to the 54 degree position, which allowed the gun to be found in the condition of readiness that was found initially. Now, <clears throat> You videotaped the results of this? Correct. Is this what we're going to see next? That's correct. Go ahead. Oh, back up there. Before you, before you do that, there's another question. How was the, we're talking about the robot or whatever you want to call it. How was the uh, gun held by the robot? What was used for that? It was a piece of padding. It was a uh, foam insert from a knee pad. From a what? A knee pad. All right. We needed something to cradle that gun and apply pressure in varying degrees. And what was around the knee pad? A Velcro strap. Yeah. If, was that it then? Or was there what held the pistol where it was at? That's how that was held in that test fire apparatus. All right, so now we have up here testing protocol. Um, <clears throat> the heart of the ammunition, the test mannequin, the remote trigger, that's a custom built Acrolac. And the magazine, you filled it to full capacity, is that correct? I did. And with, with I, filled, I, I filled the magazine uh, with seven rounds. And that's, the magazine's got full capacity, but you can put another round in the... In chamber, the chamber. Correct. correct. <clears throat> and you're, you were aware that the firearm that was involved in this had five rounds in it. Were you not? I was not made aware of that until later. Okay. In any event, this firearm, 
seven rounds would cause it to be heavier than the one with five rounds. That's correct. And uh, you have a physics background? Protection, foundation, relevance. Sustained as to the form. Okay. Uh, based on your handling of firearms and pistols, would two extra bullets be that were in the pistol cause that pistol to weigh more? Protection, no foundation for that. Actually, I'll withdraw that. I'm sorry. Thank I apologize. You, you can answer. Yes, you are correct. With extra bullets in the firearm, it would weigh more. So then what did you do? After you put the pistol where it was at? Uh, to ensure my safety, we had to load an inert round. Because if we did get the pistol to chamber correctly, we wouldn't want that pistol bouncing around on the ground uh, with a live <coughs> round in the chamber. So. <coughs> I have a background in uh, bullet <coughs> manufacturing as well. We were able to simply pull that uh, bullet out of the cartridge, remove the powder, remove the primer, put it back together. So when that gun went into battery, i.e. when it chambered the next round, it wasn't going to fire if there were any mishaps. So then what did you do? Then the gun was placed in the mannequin and it was uh, test shot. I did five test shots on, on the video that you will see here, and then I stopped to move uh, the testing apparatus into the 54 degree position. And did you do five more? I did five more. What you're seeing here is a, uh, pictures of the test setup and the overview of what was taking place. The position of the mannequin in the 89 degree position. Stop that a minute, will you? I see it's on a stool, the robot mannequin, whatever you want to call it. Um, that stool, is that the same stool, the same type of stool that was involved in this case? It was the same, same type of stool, correct. I also wanted to document in this the height of the table that is used there is approximately the height of the center island in the kitchen at Mr. Fleischauer's home. The wood flooring is similar in design as well as the carpet that the handgun was originally found on at the scene. There is volume associated with this. I don't know why we're not hearing that, but. Can we, can we get volume? Okay, stop a minute. The carpeting that on the floor there, is that a carpeting similar to the carpeting it is. And that was the second shot, is that right? I believe that was the second test fire, correct? Oh my God. You have your report there in your notes? I am looking at it now. And on that one, you've got in your notes, what do you have in your notes? Are you looking for the condition of readiness after that? No, shock sequence number two, distance traveled 13 feet 6 inches. Correct. Number two, correct. And in that one, uh, what condition was the pistol in after it traveled that distance? The fire malfunctioned and did not load or chamber another round. Correct. And going 
going back to number two, 13 feet, six inches, is, would it be fair to say that that is invalid because the pistol didn't eject the shell and put another one in the chamber? Objection, using the word valid or not so valid? Sustained as to the form of the question. Right. Jury will disregard. What do you, what is, if there is anything, what is wrong with shot sequence two? The objective here was to get uh, the distance recorded that the gun traveled as well as get the gun in the condition of readiness that was found uh, at the scene. Uh, the problem that we had in these first test shots, which you will note as we go throughout the video here, they are a bit further uh, in distance. Uh, it is because there was not as much pressure on the grip of that handgun, the gr it, which did not allow that gun to chamber correctly. So, in two shot sequence three, okay, stop. Now, according to the notes, this time the pistol flew eight feet, one inch, correct? Correct. And at that time, what happened to the bed case and the next round? That time the firearm chambered correctly. The spent case was ejected. The next round, which was the dummy or the inert round, was properly chambered. Okay. So that would uh, be a situation that was just like the, this incident. The shell ejected, yeah, another one was in the, cha one in the chamber, correct? Correct. So in order to eject the shell and put another shell in the chamber in a pistol like this, a lot of it depends on the grip, is that right? That's correct. And why is that? It's the nature of the handgun. It is the design of the handgun. Uh, a recoil-operated firearm requires uh, resistance to have the slide react against to properly chamber the next round. And when you're talking resistance, it, what it means basically is how, high, how tight you hold the grip. Yes, when training individuals, this is one of the things that we deal with on a regular basis. The, the firearm appears to not function correctly. Uh, most of the time, if it's a firearm of current manufacture and in good working condition, if the grip is adjusted on the firearm, the firearm functions correctly. And shock sequence number four. That time, how far did, it, did the uh, pistol travel? 12 feet, 8 inches. In that time, there was a the spin case didn't eject? That's correct. And there was a misfeed? Correct. And then number five? In that time, the, how far did the gun travel? 14 feet, 2 inches. And what we're talking about is flying in the air and then hitting the hard ground and going S further, correct? Where it came to a stop. And this was a similar floor and carpeting like in Chase Fleischhauer's home, is that right? Correct. When it went off of the carpeting, obviously, it slid on a concrete floor, which is not consistent with what we found at the scene. Okay. And underneath that carpet is the hardwood floor, correct? Correct. So now... What did you do after shock sequence five? Did you change anything? The position of the text fixture, the mannequin, was moved to a position uh, that was approximately 54 degrees. And if we move uh, to the next frame here, we'll be able to see the mannequin in that position.
And how far is that? That shot went nine feet. Spent case ejected, next round chambered. Which was uh, what you were looking for, correct? Correct. And the next one? Five feet, 11 inches. Spent case ejected, next round chambered. Seven feet, nine inches, spent case ejected, next round chambered. And that one, sequence four, was it? Correct. And what happened in that one? Six feet, five inches, spent case not ejected, and there was a misfeed of the next round, of the inert round. Should be able to see that in most of the, the frames. And also, I believe I saw the shell eject. There are some visible where you can see the ejected shell. And how far did that one travel? That was seven feet, one inches. Spent case ejected, next round chambered. Okay. And was that the. Total testing you did? That was the end of the testing. What did you do after that? Uh, the video was taken and compiled. The report was written. And on 12 9 of 19, the final video, which you are seeing here, was, was compiled. That's correct. And did you weigh it with the seven plus one rounds in it? I weighed it several times with uh, different round counts. The gun weight was seven plus rounds. The full capacity of the gun was 23.44 ounces. Gun weight with seven rounds of ammo was 22 point. Sorry. The gun weight with seven rounds of ammo was 22.97 ounces. Gun weight with five rounds of ammo, it's 22.03 ounces. Okay, stop there. So how many ounces difference if there's five rounds from the seven rounds? Uh, almost an ounce. Almost an ounce. And the barrel length? 3.28 inches. And that, that would be the barrel exposed or not exposed? As, me as measured from the breech to the muzzle of the gun, is 3.28 inches. Okay, is that um, when you back back the gun and the barrel's exposed and it stays there? Hold on, uh, You're not getting the full length of the barrel if you do that. You have to measure where the cartridge is inserted into the barrel to get the full barrel length. All right. So that would be when the gun is loaded ready to go, the barrel isn't exposed, correct? Correct. When it's exposed, how long, did you measure how long that barrel was? I did not. And you can, when you to eject the shell, the pistol, you can put your hand on top of it and brush it back, correct? That's correct. The ammo that you used in your testing was that similar to the ammo used the ammo on the firearm? The ammo that I used was 115 grain, 9 millimeter. Uh, the ammunition found at the scene was 115 grain, 9 millimeter. So very similar. 
and you know, spend 35 hours on construction and testing this? Objection asked and answered. Sustained. How many hours did you spend on the remote trigger construction? Approximately six hours from initial concept to completion. Thank you, sir. That's all I have. Hold on. <coughs> Garner, off well, who, I don't know that anybody's seen 325 yet. <coughs> I'm going to show you exhibit 325. Is that the report you made out with respect to your work in this case? That looks to be an accurate I'll, I'll, copy. Uh, not object to the admission of 325, subject to the what happened before we came back. Thank over. you. Court will receive and ask for those portions testified. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Kaiser. Thank you, Your Honor. Oh, excuse me. Can I no, please, Bob, you go right ahead. Okay. Mr. Kaiser. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Burton, when did you say uh, on when did you say you first learned and the phrase was about this case? I don't have the exact date, but it was in the news article that I I had seen with relation to the incident. Relatively close in time, April 14th and 15th of 2018? Correct. Without saying what was said, who uh, was the next person you talked to about it after you read the news article? The individual who was in my garage, whose car I was working on. Without saying what was said, did you come? Did there come a time when you spoke with the defendant about this incident? There was. When was that? There was a period of time where I was trying to find out what had actually happened. I didn't ask you about that. I asked you approximately when was it. So the objection is non-responsive? Yes, it is. Thank, Thank you. you. Sustained. If you can just answer the question, Mr. Burton. I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. Yep, sure. When was the first time you spoke with Kale Fleischer about it? Again, not telling me what he said. I'm asking for date, month, time, something. That's going back a couple of years. I, I have a gross approximation. Okay, but a couple two of years. Two months after the date of the incident. Thank you very much. Would it be fair to say that after that, you continue to have a sustained interest in this case? Yes. Without saying what the proceeding was, your sustained interest included uh, attending court proceedings about this case. Is that correct? Correct. Including approximately 10 days of court proceedings. Is that right? Correct. And you attended them here in court in person, right? Yes. Would it be fair to say that that was uh, because of your degree of friendship with the defendant? Correct.
Now, had there uh, come a time during the time frame that you knew the defendant, I'm sorry, did there come a time frame time during the time frame that you knew Kale Fleischauer, um, that you uh, came to know his daughter, Summer Johnson Fleischauer? Yes. Are you a user of uh, this thing called Facebook? Correct. Show me what's been marked as Exhibit 178 for identification. Would you leave through that document and mm -hmm. tell me if you recognize what it is, please? We already have a 178. Let's call it the record a second, Mr. Kaiser. I think we already have a 178. Oh. I think we're up to 180. I do. His Exhibit 180, um, a Facebook message uh, that you uh, sent to Summer Johnson Fleischauer. Yes. And it is a Facebook message that you sent to her uh, as a consequence of the uh, attending the court proceedings regarding this matter that you did. Yes. Are you offering it, Mr. Kaiser? Oh, yeah, sorry. Offer exhibit 180. Any objection, Mr. Gray? No. Thank you. Received and permission to publish. What's shown on the first page of exhibit 180? That is my Facebook profile. Uh, your photograph appears there? That's correct. Who are you with? That's my daughter. the same thing, but uh, what's the message below the small circle say? Uh, the you and Corey aren't connected on Facebook? So you and Summer Johnson Fleischauer well, were not connected on Facebook, is that correct? Correct. Turning to um, the first uh, portion of the Facebook message, it appears to have been authored at 4.34 in the morning, is that correct? Yes. to say that um, this message that you sent to her um, is a uh, message that only she would get? Yes. Not sure if I have the terminology right, but that would be a private message in Facebook Messenger? I'm not a big Facebook person, but it is a 
forum that I use to reach out to some I was people. relying on you. You're the IT guy. <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> I'm a very, not a big fan of Facebook, to be honest with you. But you used it here. I, I, correct, I did. At 4.30 in the morning. A, a sleepless night, yes. Fair to say, a sleepless night as a consequence of what you had witnessed by sitting through 10 days of court. I don't know when this was sent, but it was gut wrenching, correct? Your Honor, you may approach. Yes. Mr. Kaiser, question. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate that. Um, it, it's pretty far from the jurors. You have the paper in front of you, is that right? Correct. Could you just read to us what you wrote so far on this third page of Exhibit uh, 180? Beginning with, hey, Summer. Yep, that'd be great. Hey, Summer, I'm so sorry to see that okay. you... Sorry. <laughs> hey, Summer, I am so sorry to see you have to relive the most horrible moment in your life. It is so heartbreaking to watch. The love that you have for Chase flooded the courtroom yesterday. In a sense, it brought comfort. Unfortunately, though, it has also brought back so much pain that time has had some effect to heal. I have no idea why I'm writing you this. I hardly know you. I met you two or three times. The most recent was helping your dad move into his new place. Continue on. Yep. I have been sick after seeing the pictures. Thankfully, just a glance and cheering your heartache. So then um, on what would be page of exhibit 180. Could you tell us what you wrote there, please? Beginning with morning. Yep, thank you. I am not sleeping. I imagine I am not the only one. I just had to say a couple of things. I'm sorry for the loss of your brother. My son is the same age. Kayla and I talked about our kids often, sometimes to share the obvious frustration of teens. What was most evident was the overall overwhelming love that we shared for them. I have no idea why I'm sending this. I'm not a Facebooker. That is all that I have at this moment. The second thing I wanted to say is that I hope at some point you find comfort and healing. You are a beautiful young lady that has accomplished much and deserve even more. I don't want anything to hold you back. But I... F and then uh, turning to page five of the exhibit one Continue on. Yep, thank you. But I fear that at some point in your life, it will probably be much later that you, if you harbor these hard feelings and, and will, and I will, and I'll will, spelling, against your dad, it will greatly impact your progression, happiness, and love for those that are closest to you. How do I know? I've experienced the damage of not forgiving my dad or ending his life early. It is a long story, but in the end, I have suffered, and so have my kids. If I could change one thing in my life, it would be to forgive the terrible thing that he did and allow that love and peace to affect me and this next generation. This sucks. Here's wishing you the best summer. I'll be praying you get through this week and hope for some recovery as soon as possible. Take care, girl. That'd be the last sentence. Is that right? Take girl. Take care, girl. You got good things coming, if you will let them in. So if we could just go back to the page before that for a minute, um, just so we're clear about what it is you were writing to her when you were referring to your tragedy, which I'm sorry. Uh, Thank you. You wrote. If I could change one thing in my life, it would be to forgive the terrible thing he did, meaning your dad, 
and allow that love and peace to affect me and the next generation. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Bless you. So, um, what'd you say the name of your new company is? Confidence Gun Safety and Self Defense. Would it be fair to say then that the focus of the training that you would give to people in that company would be in regards to the careful uh, handling and storage of their firearms? Correct. careful um, handling and storage of firearms would um, include keeping them um, at least in an enclosed space, would that be fair to say? Yes. And um, it would include uh, keeping them cased, if there would be a case or holster that it would apply to, is that correct? Correct. And not putting them in a place where someone could access them, would that be fair to say? If there were young kids around, correct. And certainly if one were to access it, the last thing one would want it to be would be to be loaded. Is that right? For self-defense, it would want to be, you'd want it to be loaded. And for self-defense, one would want to keep it in the place that would be uh, most accessible at the moment that might be necessary. Is that fair to say? That would be fair to say. So for instance, if one were worried that someone might break into their house at night when one is asleep, one would want to have that pistol close at hand by their bed. Is that fair to say? That would be logical. Other than this project, It seems that confidence, gun safety, and self-defense wouldn't have anything to do with what you've done here. Correct. If you know, prior to the defendants, actually, I have to ask a question before that. I apologize, Judge. Were you friends with the defendant long enough to have known his father, Rod? Judge, for the fifth time, I object to what he terms my client the defendant. Sustained, Mr. Kaiser. Did you know the defendant long enough to know? Same objection, Mr. Mr. Kaiser. Uh, pl uh, please. Mr. Burton, um, did you know Kale Fleischauer long enough to know his father? On a personal level, no. How did you come to find out that, that, the, that Kale Fleischauer's father had passed away? Kale had told me. Whenever that was, and I'm not asking for the date, but whenever that was, uh, you recall how, if at all, how many times uh, you and the defendant 
had gone shooting prior to that date. Again, Judge, I object. Mr. Kaiser, I've asked you to refer to Mr. Fleischauer as Mr. Fleischauer. Now, if I have to enter an order, I will. I understand. But I prefer that, not to. I'm sorry. Prior to the time that you learned that Kale Fleischauer's father had passed away, uh, how, if at all, how many times had you gone shooting with him? I don't recall. We didn't. Excuse me, is that some ambiguous question? Is he talking about Kale Fleischauer? Or well, his you'll, you'll have a chance and redirect. He answered the question. He understood it. Were there any times after Kale Fleischauer's father passed away that you went shooting with him? No. In talking about the fifth shooting uh, that happened in um, exhibit, I think, 327, the video, you said and used the phrase, what we found at the scene. Could you tell me what you meant by what we found at the scene? It's a bad habit using we as in the a lot of us have a lot of bad habits so i apologize for mine um who's the we in that I. sense okay and what scene did you find something at that related to the exercise uh, you did here oh i didn't i i was not at the scene In your job or in the NRA certified pistol instructor course, you learn how to teach other people how to shoot a pistol. Is that correct? That's correct. In our NRA certified range safety officer course, you took that online. Is that right? That's correct. Since it was online, the focus of that training was not about firing a pistol, firing a, a firearm of any kind, was it? No. Was it in regards to how to maintain safety for shooters as well as uh, onlookers at a firing range? Yes. Thank you for your service. Was the Thank M16 you. rifle the uh, standard issue uh, shoulder arm for you when you were in the service? That's correct. What was your sidearm? We had no sidearm. This is a certificate of achievement uh, for a defensive handgun course at Front Sight, Pahrump, Nevada. And Front Sight Institute, Nevada is listed on your uh, resume, your curriculum vitae. Is that correct? 323? It is, depicting current training. 
Move exhibit 181 and Devin. No objection. Received. Yes. Thank you, sir. So, um, Frontside Firearms Training Institute in Las Vegas is what's termed a four day defensive handgun course. Is that correct? That's correct. Are the various positions that the person is in on this screen uh, various positions of defensive firearms handling that you learned during that class? Some are representative. And there were others, right? There were. But ultimately, the bottom line of this class was that it was about defensive handgun use. I'm a little disappointed that I don't see the distinguished graduate sticker on there. I don't know if that was covered up by the exhibit, but. And that's because you were a really good shot, right? I did okay. But not because you learned anything about setting up scenarios about gunfire recall, right? Uh, recoil? That is correct. The class that we just looked on the screen at uh, was in January of 2020, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, your report that we have marked here uh, that you uh, read to us from uh, was dated December 9th of 2019, is that right? Correct. So whatever it is that you learned in Las Vegas in January, that doesn't bear upon uh, whatever qualifications you may feel you had to do the testing in December of, 19, of 2019. Is that right? Correct. Now, you said you've uh, been around firearms as long as you can remember, is that correct? That's correct. Other than the uh, numerous test fires that you performed here, um, never done any other test firing to test what the recoil distance of a firearm would be, is that correct? Correct. What um, studies did you rely on in order to come to the conclusion about how you would construct these uh, firearms tests? Being the unique nature of, of these uh, incidents, there was no scientific method uh, that was available to, uh, to rely on. So you read no articles in any journals? Nothing was referenced. Didn't attend any training where there would be people who would train you how to do this? That's correct. Didn't um, study any writings about where firearms would fall at the time of a gunshot fired by a person at themselves? The research I did turned up nothing. Fair to say that other than your conception of how this should be done, there was no scientific basis that you could find for doing this type of test firing of the recall that you've performed here. Is that right? That's correct.
Have you ever been trained in any other type of reconstruction of scenarios? Involving firearms? Yes. No. Um, one of the propositions that you put forth in your report, which I think I labeled three, or got labeled by the court as 325. Do you still have a copy of your report up there? I do. Thank you. And hey, Mr. Kaiser, we're going to get into the actual, I mean, testimony, because I'm going to take a break now. It appears you're kind of going into the actual uh, uh, testing. So with that said, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take our recess. Don't form any opinions. If you have any discussion, search or deliberation. See you back in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. All right.